and finding a note on here about, uh, you guys know the color of the paint in here is, is worldly gray. And so we're going to be painting some of that downstairs. So uh, I love coming to the pulpit and seeing a gall- one gallon of worldly gray. That's the way to start off Sunday morning. Uh, all right, Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. And um, I want to continue our study on, on spiritual warfare, on Christian warfare. And without rehashing what we've been looking at on Wednesday nights, we, we've talked quite a bit about the fact that there are, uh, there are religions in the world that tend to think that the battle that uh, uh, should be waged at this time is a physical, uh, one is a, a, a uh, one that involves physical warfare. Uh, the Bible teaches us quite the opposite for the Christian. Uh, Look at Ephesians chapter 6, and look, if you would, at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, and make no mistake about it, you are in warfare. Uh, You may not always see it, you may not always realize it as a Christian, but if you're a born-again child of God, you have been enlisted into a spiritual army. And uh, look, if you would, at Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 11. The Bible says here, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, there are some people that think the devil is a, is a force or a, a personification of evil, but is not a real person. We're going to address that this morning. I think I was talking with Miss Debbie about that, someone that she'd been talking to about that very subject. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about how you have a real enemy. And uh, the Bible has some things to say about him. I don't like to give any more... Um, Airtime, if you will, and that's an interesting term to use for the subject of the devil, but I don't like to give him any more airtime than we, we need to. Uh, I don't like to talk about him any more than, than we have to, but at the same time, you need to know who your enemy is so you can know how to fight him. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and it says there uh, in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not... That, that phrase, flesh and blood, you ought to underline that and pay attention to that. Um, over there in Corinthians, where it talks about inheriting the kingdom of God, it says, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, That flesh and blood is, is talking about the physical, mortal body that you have. Now, remember when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and they were troubled because they thought they had seen a spirit. What did he tell them? A spirit hath not flesh and bones, not blood. That's important. Flesh and bones, as you see me have. Your glorified body is going to have flesh and bones. It's going to be a glorified version of what you are now. All right? But there's going to be something different about you that is, that is not, that in contrast to your body now, you've got blood which is corrupt. That's why you're dying. All right? The way you sin is death, the Bible says. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. All right? And that's what's corrupt. And that's why Jesus Christ, as a sinless Savior, all right, as the Bible says in Acts, well, look, look at Acts chapter 20. A little side note for you this morning, but it's important, worthy of paying attention to. Look at Acts chapter 20 and uh, verse number 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. And you ought to really pay attention. You ought to really pay attention to when you see pronouns in the Bible. He, uh, she, them. All right, when it, when, it, when it uses those things, you ought to look back and see who the he is. Who the them is, who the she is, all right? Here in verse 28, Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, who's the he? God, right? He says, uh, to feed the church of God, comma, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's why you can be saved, because you have sinless blood. You have a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ, very different than our blood, right? That's what makes us different. Our, our sin nature corrupts that. And as a result, uh, when you have a glorified body, you're no longer flesh and blood, you're flesh and bones, as you see him have after the resurrection. That's why it says here, go back to Ephesians 6 and verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, our battle is not with other people, all right? Our battle, you may think your problem is with your spouse, you may think your problem is with, you know, uh, 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 this, your boss or some other person that's really rubbing you the wrong way. The real battle you have as a Christian is not with another person. 
Now, there will be some physical enemies that come your way for sure, but the main one you have is a spiritual one. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. You ever have people tell you, well, why are you against so much? Because the Bible says you should be against some things, all right? Now, there's some things you ought to be for as a Christian, but it says you're against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, and notice that last phrase, in high places. And we talked, uh, we, we went through and talked about how the invisible things of God point, or the, excuse me, the visible things that we see around us point to the invisible things of God. We talked about in the beginning God, all right? And we talked about the creation of invisible things, all right? And uh, where that thing takes place. It takes place before Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to mention that for sure again this morning. We talked about the, uh, the obedient angels. There's some other things I want to point out about them, so we'll pick it up there. And uh, I want to, uh, again, as I mentioned last, uh, last Sunday, talking about some misconceptions about spiritual beings and about angels and things like that, I want to go through some of these things. Angels are appearances. Go to, go to Matthew chapter 18. There's a, one of the most misunderstood um, things in the Bible, I would say, when it comes to people. Uh, I'll, say that, I'll put it to you this way. There's a lot of people that are curious about the spirit world, um, however they, they choose to sort of put things together on their own without going to the Bible. And, and here's the thing. Um, I've got thoughts about things. I've got opinions about things. So why should my opinion be any better than yours or vice versa? That's why you have to have something as a final authority. And as a Christian, you say it's the Bible. Okay, so if the Bible talks about these things, let's look at this. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 18 and look, if you would, at verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. And uh, what a lot of people have taken that passage to mean is that everyone has a guardian angel. So everywhere you go, there's this little angel that sort of hovers over you and makes sure you don't get in trouble and makes sure that you know you're safe. And, um, you know, I... <laughs> From, from the, the religion that my family came from, everything, there was a saint for everything. There's a saint, and it was sort of like an angelic being that watched over you and made sure, you know, there's a saint for travel. There's a saint for, you know, uh, 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 you're purchasing homes. There's a saint for everything, all right? Uh, you, the Bible doesn't necessarily teach you have a, a, a specific assigned guardian angel, but it does talk about this. It says, their angels doth behold their father's face in heaven. So that's, that's an interesting passage. What do you do with that? All right, so look at Acts chapter number 7, and, and what we're going to point out here is that while I don't think it's clear from Scripture that you have guardian angels, I, I don't believe that, I don't think it, the Bible teaches that, um, I do believe that there's, a, there's something to be said about an appearance of someone, uh, and angels are an appearance of something. People say, well, angels are messengers. Some are, some are. I mean, you read about that with Gabriel. One thing is for sure, they are an appearance of something. All right, look at Acts chapter number 7, and uh, look, if you would, at verse number 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Now, that angel in the Old Testament is spoken of as the angel of the Lord, and I believe that's a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. But look what it says. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. All right? And that appearance is the appearance of God before Jesus Christ takes on human form. The angel, an angel of the Lord. But then it says, that angel of the Lord that's in that fire speaks, and it says it's the voice of who? Look at verse number uh, 31. Who's the voice? The Lord's. It's the Lord's voice. So that, that tells you that angel is an appearance of God before Jesus Christ ever came. All right? Uh, look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. So just trying to address some things that people think about when they, when they come up to the uh, subject of angels. And this is, uh, interesting enough, this is one of those pages that I have, I was like, man, where's Genesis 32? I know I have it here somewhere. It fell out of my Bible. Genesis 32. Some of you are worried about some of the things that I've, uh, as far as scripture, so look at that. I'm, now I'm ripping out page of the Bible. I, I promise you this did not come out because I ripped it out. Uh, Genesis 32, and look if you would, at uh, verse number 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, 
for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, you'd have to go back to see what he's talking about. Um, look at, uh, oh, let's see here. I'm flipping this thing over. Genesis 32, and look at verse number one. Yeah, thank you. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God, look at that plural, met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. A host, by the way, you can underline that, a host is a, uh, an army. All right? It's a group of fighting forces. So when the Bible talks about the host of the Lord or the captain of the host of the Lord, he's talking about someone that's leading an army. So this is an angelic army. This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, so on and so forth. Now go down further and uh, look what it says here. Uh, down in verse number 13. I'm sorry, no, that's not it. Verse... Uh, 24. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Whoever this is is pretty strong. You touch someone, you know, and, and just basically they're, they're incapable of, of moving that part of their body. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I, I will not let thee go. Now this is the angel saying, let me go. For the day breaketh. Now notice, it says there in verse 24, he wrestled with what? It says he wrestled with a man, right? So as far as if you're just, an unbe if you're just reading this, you say, okay, randomly, he's there by himself. And some guy shows up and they start wrestling, all right? Uh, now keep in mind, he, met, he, he came upon the host of God. The angels of God met him. Then it says here in verse 24, a man wrestled with him. Keep reading. It, it says here in verse... Uh, 26, he said, that's the angel of the man, let me go. Then Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said to him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Now, what you have in Genesis 32 is a great picture of spiritual warfare in prayer. Wrestling with the Lord in prayer. Right? Not letting go of the Lord until you sense that God has spoken to you, giving you an answer on something. All right, and that's what we're called to do. Now, there's something more interesting, though, if you keep reading. Look at uh, verse 30 again. In, or, I'm sorry, verse uh, 29. Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Isn't that interesting? So, so the angel says, What's your name? He says, Jacob. He says, No more is to be called Israel. Well, Jacob's like, Typical, you know, typical guy. Well, what's your name? You're asking me all this information. You know, it's like when you get pulled over and they're asking for your license and registration and where, you know, insurance and where you're coming from and where you're going. And after a while, you're going, where are you coming from? Where are you going? You just want to ask them the same questions. And that's where Jacob's at. And the Lord tells him here, Wherefore is it thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called and named that place Benal. Why? For I have seen God face to face. Now, you learn from Exodus... That if a man saw the face of God in all of his glory, that man would not live. Moses speaks of that. And he says, uh, Lord, let me see your face. He said, look, I'll let you see my hinder parts. Because if you'd see me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't live. If you saw me in all my glory. And when Moses came down from that mountain, just seeing the backside of God, he came down glowing. So here Jacob says he saw God face to face. So either there's a contradiction in the Bible or what you see is an appearance of God through an angelic being, if you will, the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, not God in all the fullness of his glory. But Jacob says he's seen God face to face, and God did not correct him for saying that. So he saw God, he saw an appearance of him, through what? Through an angelic being, through the angel of the Lord. All right. Uh, and again, angels are spoken of in masculine form. Now, you know, you come upon pictures, and I'll, I'll even use some pictures that, that show things like, for example, angels with wings. The Bible never says they have wings. Says they can fly. You say, well, how do they fly? Well, think about Jesus Christ, man. He, he rose from the dead. I don't remember him, you know, showing up at the resurrection with wings on him, you know. I mean, he flew up to the third heaven. He says there uh, to that lady, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended there in that garden. And then later on that day, he speaks to them and he says, hey, put your hand in my side. Touch me and feel me. 
right? That was within the same day. He'd already gone up, you know, several light years and back down. That's flying. That's moving. But he didn't have wings. He didn't need wings, all right? You're going to have a glorified body someday. And I always tell my kids this stuff. You know, you're going to fly around like Superman in the new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I get excited to think about that because if you think about what Hollywood has to present, uh, we recently saw a movie, and this movie has prophecy uh, about a, a Messiah that's going to come, and his mother's name was Mary. His mother's name was Mary. He's a Messiah. He's spoken of in prophecy. They get all this stuff from the Bible, right? Uh, flying around. Everyone wants to fly around. Uh, that's from the Bible, all right? Jesus Christ did it, but he didn't have to have wings to do it. One of the other things that people will say is that, uh, you know, they'll always talk about a, her voice is as beautiful as an angel. And we'll talk about the angelic choir, you know, and, and, and sounding like a, a beautiful female choir. Unfortunately, ladies, they're spoken of in masculine form anytime they show up in the Bible, and there's some scripture there for you. Another thing that's interesting about them, they are, again, we're talking about how they are appearances of something. And so far, we've given examples of how they're an appearance of God to men through the angel of the Lord, uh, but they're also an appearance of something else. Go to Revelation, go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation, and uh, chapter, go to chapter number 1. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, verse 4. All right, he's addressing the seven local churches that are there in Asia Minor. All right, and then look, if you would, at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, uh, I don't know, and I'm not going to try to venture out into places that I don't necessarily fully understand. Someone asked me one time, uh, does that mean that every local church has an angel in heaven? I don't, I don't know about that, an appearance of them before the Father. Uh, I don't know. I mean, then you get into some really goofy stuff. So every time there's a church split, do you have another angel pop up out of somewhere? Or does the angel get split in half? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you this much, though. There in Revelation chapter 1, and there's obviously something different about these seven local churches. They're not just local churches. They are uh, a picture of, of churches throughout church history. And, and there's obviously prophetic implication of what you read in these seven churches about the tribulation. So there's a, a uniqueness about those seven churches. But one thing is for sure, there's an angel that represents each one of those churches before the Lord. All right? So what, you, what is that? That's an appearance of that local church to God. All right? And it's an appearance of that child in its innocence before, the God, before God in Matthew chapter 18. All right? So before which time, for sure, I think you can teach, before which time that, that, that person, that child, comes to a place where they understand... The difference between good and evil, not so much uh, right, you know, this is, this is good, this is bad. I mean, you can teach a kid at two years old, don't touch, hot, bad. It doesn't mean they understand that it's evil to disobey, okay? That comes later. When they get to a place where they clearly understand that innocence is lost, it's like the Garden of Eden all over again for every sinner that comes into this world. And uh, for sure, though, prior to that time, uh, and that's what Matthew 18 is talking about, hurting one of those little ones, all right, the innocent ones, all right, their, their face, their angel's face to behold their father in heaven, all right, that's what that's talking about. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 12. So you have angels as appearances of local churches. You also have angels being a representation or an appearance of a nation. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, and we uh, talked a little bit about this uh, last week. Week, talking about Michael the archangel. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, and so on and so forth. All right? So again, you have an appearance of that nation before a representation, if you will, before God for the nation of Israel. All right? So, and we also understand this, and we'll look at all these verses, but angels, the obedient angels, that's what we're talking about, they are in the presence of God in heaven. All right? So, you know, there are verses in the Bible, and, and again, they've made shows about, you know, touched by an angel, okay? All right, she was a female, so, eh, 
<laughs> right? Not biblically accurate, all right? But uh, they have these shows about, like, this guardian angel or, you know, uh, this family gets in a fight and they're all bickering about Christmas and this family shows up at their house needing help and they find out after they left and they changed their lives, everything's happy and glorious in this Christmas time, they find out that that family died a year ago in a car crash. You know, and, oh, it's an angel, it's a bunch of angels and they came. So the reason that people go off on that tangent, it's important to understand why, um, is for two things. They get some of that from Matthew 18. The other, because it's about the angels, you know, beholding the Father's face in heaven. The other part of it is, the Bible does talk about uh, um, entertaining angels unaware. And so people will go on about stories where, you know, so-and-so gave me something, and I went back to ask who was that person, and no one's ever seen him before. They must be an angel. I'm not going to, you know, poo-poo the whole entire thing, but you can make a doctrine out of something that, where there's not a, a whole lot of Scripture there, and you've got to be careful with that, all right? Uh, I'm not going to say that that can't happen. God could send an angel if he wanted to, to, to minister to his people. As the Bible says, they're ministering spirits, all right? Uh, that all said, uh, I would say be careful of getting caught up in always looking for, for some kind of extraterrestrial being and sign for, for God to do. God can do something in your life with another Christian. God can do something in your life through the preaching of the Word of God. God can do something supernatural in your life uh, through, quite frankly, uh, a, a lost person that is your, your, your master, your boss, your employer. All right, the Lord can do a lot of things without necessarily saying the angel down. All right, so does the Bible teach guardian angels? I don't know that it does. Um, I believe for a fact you can you can make that you can definitely say without hesitation, angels are an appearance of something to somebody. In some cases, they're an appearance to God of of people, and in some cases, they're an appearance of God to men. All right, um, so th that's the uh, obedient angels. We talked about Michael the archangel last. We won't go into all of that again, but we'll just, again, mention he's the, uh, the angel that stands for the nation of Israel. He's the only archangel given that title in the Bible. People talk about Gabriel the archangel. That is not found in the Bible. Uh, now, look, if you're going to talk about, you know, uh, folklore and legend and uh, tradition, I mean, you could, you could teach a lot of different things, all right? But we're talking about looking at what we understand about God through the Bible. You say, why, why is that so critical? Because once you get out of that realm, anything goes. I can make God anything I want Him to be if I don't stick to the Bible. And quite frankly, that's what a lot of people do. And they do that in the area of spiritual beings as well. When it comes to the invisible things, people are intrigued by that. Um, and you see that going back to the Garden of Eden. Why do you suppose Eve stood there and talked? I think there's something appealing about that, that serpent speaking with her. Now, I can't, I can't necessarily prove it from Scripture, but... I don't know that the animals all talked like that serpent did. Some would argue that. So you get into this stuff, it's really interesting. Did all the animals talk? Did Adam talk to them in whole conversations? I don't know. I can tell you this much, they don't have souls. So I would think if they don't have souls, they can't communicate like we do. All right, so maybe there, that was part of the appeal for Eve is this serpent is speaking. There's something supernatural there. People are drawn to that. Why do you suppose everyone wants to take pictures of like, Maria on the tortilla, you know, the mother of God, as they call her on the tortilla, or, you know, the, I, there was this big thing in Florida a couple years back, and it was a huge window, like a big glass, it was on a church, and, you know, like the condensation and the fog and all that, well, it made this silhouette of, you know, the virgin, so everyone's flocking, you know, to this church to see the, the silhouette of, you know, the virgin, and, and, and we understand that she was but a virgin, but then she, she had Jesus, who was her firstborn, and had children after that, so she wasn't perpetually a virgin, but they call her that, you know, it's, it's uh, no different than, you know, the guy wipes his face, and he looks down, and he sees oh, the face of Jesus, oh, you know, and they worship this stuff, all right, people are always looking for a sign, that's not the point of the study, but the point of the study is to understand, though, that when you're praying, and when things are happening in your life, there is a spiritual component to what's going on. And even though you can't see everything, there are things and, and people that are there, so to speak. All right? Now, uh, there's some false doctrine. All right? uh, one of the things that, when it comes to angels, and I mentioned this, the patron saint of doctors, police, soldiers, etc., is supposed to be Michael the Archangel because he's a warrior. All right? And uh, so... I'll say, hey, you should pray this prayer to Michael the Archangel before you go into bat battle. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. So on and so forth. Now, 
Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is, the Bible clearly says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I've mentioned this before. You know the problem? It's funny when people say you're in a cult because you believe the Bible. It's the most, uh, the most contrary thing you could ever say about believing the Bible. You and I'll tell them. Someone comes to me and says, uh, Pastor, what do you think about this? Well, I'll, I'll try to give you the best answer I can from the Bible. All right, and if I say something, and, and you can show me biblically that I'm wrong, you know, I'll say, wow, praise the Lord for truth. I'm wrong. I was wrong this whole entire time. Uh, why is it important? I, I think it was uh, Jim Jones. I think I, gave it, I talked about this recently. Uh, a couple came to him, and they said, hey, we want to follow you, but the Bible says this. And he took their Bible and threw it on the ground. He says, you need to quit reading that book. Look, you're in a cult when they throw the Bible out, not when they're including the Bible. Okay, uh, and so that's what ties us together. Otherwise, I'd say something, he thinks something, you think something, and we all just sit around and go, hey, you know what, I've been to some of these Bible studies where literally that's what happens. Everyone's got a different version of the Bible, and they'll go, what do you think, what do you think, and what do you think? And honestly, uh, you don't really get anywhere studying the Bible like that. You just get a lot of opinion, all right? And so let me get back to this, all right? There's some false doctrine associated with this, and these, some of these people mean well, I mean, think about it. Let's say a guy's lost, and he's going to battle, and he's over there in Fallujah. He's over there in Tikrit. They're about ready to go into battle. And the guy gets out his, his rosary, and he prays his rosary. I read a book recently about a, a soldier, uh, a, uh, a pilot, fighter pilot in World War II, a German fighter pilot. And uh, he said by the end of that war, that rosary was pretty much gray. It was purple. It started off as black. He, he, man, he was going through those beads like crazy before every battle. And there's a sincere person. And they want God to be with them. They want God on their side. I'm not throwing stones at them. I'm just saying that, that's not in and of itself going to get you the power of God. St. Michael has no more power than Brother Joel does to pray for you. Truly. And you say, why? Because that's not how that's supposed to work. You're supposed to go straight to your high priest, Jesus Christ. All right, now, we talked about uh, uh, Michael the archangel. We talked about... Uh, Obviously, we talk about the Lord, first off, in the beginning God. Talk about Michael the archangel. Here's something about Gabriel, all right? Uh, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, he helps Daniel understand the visions concerning the second coming. Now, that's important because in both comings, first coming, we understand he comes and he talks to Zechariah, and then he also talks to Mary about uh, being with child, all right? There in Luke chapter number 1. So he addresses the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. That would be a great example of how God uses an angel as a messenger. Right? And he brings a specific message. And the message is, he's coming. He's coming. All right? So uh, you see that he gives revelation concerning Daniel's 70th week. Again, both the first and second coming. Daniel chapter 9, verses 21 through 27. Uh, and again, Gabriel is a messenger. But never in Scripture is he called an archangel. And that's important. Now, uh, here we are talking about uh, Satan. And again, as I mentioned, I, I don't want to spend uh, more time on him than I have to. But it's important to understand your enemy. And uh, the Bible says that he's head over all wicked spiritual beings. We just read it in Ephesians chapter number 6. Uh, John chapter 10 verse 10 says, a thief, The thief cometh not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. That is his role in your life. In John chapter 10, what God does, he gives a great contrast between the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, and, and uh, the, the wolf, if you will, that will come in sheep's clothing. Right? In other parts of the Bible, he's called the lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. But he comes for three things, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Now you go, why? Well, he can't take my soul. That's true. If you're saved, he can't do that. But he can kill your joy. He can steal your peace. You know how many Christians don't sleep at night worried about stuff? They open the door to something they shouldn't have opened in their life. Uh, you, know, you know how many Christians are walking around and they're bitter, bitter people. You say, what happened? He destroyed their joy. Now they let them. They opened the door to that. Started off as a work of the flesh, but the longer you stay in that thing, you don't confess it and recognize it for what it is. You open up a door in your life to Satan's influence, and it shouldn't be there. Now, I, I hear people all the time say, well, uh, uh, Satan can't uh, uh, possess a Christian. 
How many of you have heard that before? Okay, he can't, he can't possess a Christian. He can oppress, but he can't possess. Now, that's a sort of nice cliche, you know, little jargon there, but it's not necessarily biblical. Now, think about this. Can he possess your soul? No. Sealed. But you've got a vessel. You've got an earthly vessel that you allow to be filled with uh, your own spirit. And your own spirit can be influenced by another spirit. As a matter of fact, um, I, and, and this is not new for some of you, but look at Acts chapter 5. Go to Acts chapter 5. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, we're going we're to end on the right note in regards to this, because he's not greater. Greater is he that is in you, the Lord Jesus Christ, than he that is in the world, Satan, okay? Uh, we're we're going to end this the right way, but I, I do want you to understand, uh, it's serious business. Um, I, I'll say this too. We tend to think of like Satan worship or, or you know, satanic influence as being like voodoo or in uh, Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic or Cuba, Santeria, where they mix Catholicism with voodoo. Um, or you think of it like that. And you, know, you hear, you hear the, the village drum, doom, 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 and the, the witch doctor's doing his little dance where you go, oh, that's, that's obviously satanic. I've had missionaries come from overseas, and they land in Atlanta. They go, this is more spiritually dark than where I just came from. And they can sense stuff because they're around some of that stuff there in Africa and in, in, you know, in the Caribbean and stuff like that. And they go, there's something off here. Now, we, just, so we, get, we get so used to whatever's around us, we don't notice, we don't really care. Uh, but, but in the Bible, there are specific things to point to somebody being influenced by Satan. All right? Now, look at Acts chapter 5, and I want to point out to you, in Scripture, now this is another important thing to, to, to point out. In the Bible, when someone professes to be a brother or sister in Christ, you know how you treat them? As a brother or sister in Christ. Even if you go, I don't know if they're really saved. Well, maybe they don't know if you're really saved. Okay? I, I, I get tired of the really saved thing. Well, is there not a really... Is, I'm just fake saved. I'm not really saved. I'm just fake saved. You know, I'm, I'm half saved. I'm half baked. I don't understand what that means. But here in Acts chapter 5, you have people that profess to be Christians as far as you can read. Acts 5, but a certain man, verse 1, named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath who? Filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Now you know the rest of the story. He kicks the bucket, then his wife shows up and they ask her, hey, did you sell everything? She goes, oh yeah. You know, didn't you see my latest tweet? Didn't you see what I posted? Here's all the money. We took pictures to get on Facebook and all that. And then she drops dead, right? And so, but, but look at that, what it says here in verse number three. Why has Satan filled thine heart? Save people. Now, uh, for, in light of what I'm talking about, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, actually go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Go there. Um, I, I, I'm bringing this up because Sometimes in your own life, you're going to have to deal with these things. You're going to have to deal with people that are struggling and sometimes spiritually with some spiritually dark things. And sometimes they're safe people. And instead of assuming that they're lost because they're struggling with these influences, uh, you need to learn to treat them as a brother. And that doesn't always mean that you go along with their agenda. Now, let me give you an example of that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, look, if you would, at verse number uh, 9. Verse number 9. Now, this is Paul giving instruction to the church of Corinth because they have someone in their church that is, you know, I'm just going to say it like it is. According to the Bible, he's sleeping with his father's wife. Now, it's not real clear if it's his biological mom or stepmom or mother-in-law. I don't know how that thing works. But it ain't good. Can we say amen to that? However you want to slice and dice that thing, it's a bad deal. So in verse 9, because this guy's in the church, he's part of the church, it says, I wrote on you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. But then he clarifies. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, there's the lost people, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. In other words, if you didn't say hi and you weren't friendly and you didn't have some element of interaction with people that are covetous or idolaters or fornicators that are lost, you would be a monk. 
That's what Paul is saying there, in essence. And that's what the monks did. They retreated from the world, and they go to live holy lives. We cut ourselves off from everybody. And some Christians try to live that way. That's not what Paul is saying. All right? Matter of fact, he goes on to say this. Look at verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is a brother. Is that what it says? No. Any man that is what? Called a brother. Now, I don't flippantly call someone brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. I try to get an idea if they have a testimony of salvation. But if they got the testimony and they're saying that they're saved, I, okay, you're, you're my brother in Christ. If your testimony is you place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, at, plus nothing, so you repented of who you are as a sinner, you aren't trusting your righteousness or religion or any good work, you, you repented of who you are as a sinner and you turned to God through Jesus Christ and you accepted Him as your Savior by faith, I have to go by that testimony and say, you're my brother. And I may have my doubts, but I'll keep it myself. That said, if someone's living, look what he says here in verse 11. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Now, you know, this is the kind of passage that gets real sticky around the holidays, right? You say, why? Because you get some of your family around who profess to be saved. And they're living certain lifestyles. And you know what? You know, I, I've, I have had people say, but pastor their family. Okay. Hey, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. What you do with it's up to you. Now, I've drawn a line in the sand for my own family just because I believe it's what the Bible would have me do. And, and look, it's not a matter of I think I'm so great that I will not fellowship with you, you know, unholy. That is not the idea. The idea is this. I am weaker than you think I am. And if I hang out with people that are living that kind of lifestyle and they say they're saved, it is that much easier for me to fall in it because after all, they're Christians, aren't they? Right? And, and, and what, what I'm getting at is this. Christian people can be affected spiritually in dark ways. All right? And they can still be saved. Just because someone is, uh, and I, I know this is going to be a really interesting subject for some of you, but I believe this to be the case. I believe somebody could be saved and they could and be an adulterer. I believe someone could be saved and be a thief. I think someone could be saved and, <gasps> believe it or not, I believe this, I believe that they could practice homosexuality. Now you say, what's the difference? Here's what I think the difference between a saved person and a lost person. I'm not saying that it's a good idea, first off, let me say that. I'll also say it doesn't mean they're not full of the devil because you can be saved and full of the devil. All right. What I am saying is this. I believe if someone's saved and they're doing that, I think they're grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and there's a conflict inside of them like no other. Whereas before they're saved, it's, hey, gay pride and all the rest. I think if you're genuinely saved, it's, yeah, I do that. But I think if you're saved, there's going to be a side of you that goes, I don't know, don't know that I want to profess pride in that. <laughs> say, why? Because the Holy Spirit's there. You know how it was before you got saved to how, how it is now, especially when you get under Bible preaching. There are some things that you used to just, for, you know, joke around about, and it was just part of life, and it was a joke, and we all talk about this stuff, and now, I'm not saying it's all out of your life. There are things you still struggle with, but you know, just as well as I do, there are times where someone may be talking about it and laughing about it, and you go, it's not funny anymore. I still struggle with that. I'm not going to tell them, but I still struggle with that. Now, why am I saying all that? Because I'm trying to get you to understand, you can be saved, and you can be filled, according to what the Bible says, taking the Bible literally, Acts chapter 5, filled in your heart, spiritually speaking, with, Satan's, with Satan and his influence. Now, you have to do one of two things. You either have to explain away what the Bible says, and for those of you that say, I take the Bible literally, if you take it literally, okay, there in Acts chapter 5, what do you do with that? You have, to, you have to come to grips with the fact that Satan can influence a saved person. He can't take your soul, but your spirit can be influenced. And your body can be influenced. And your mind can be influenced. And I know, I know people that I believe are genuinely born again who struggle with an addiction to drugs. And I'll tell you right now, man, drugs will open you up to stuff. You know, people say, I, I saw this stuff climbing on the wall, you know. Hey, I don't believe that they're all just loopy and that there's nothing there. I think there's some stuff around us that God protects us from seeing. But when you mess with certain things in your body, you open yourself up to influences that will allow you to see things you probably don't want to see or don't need to see. All right? 
So, uh, again, we're talking about the devil and his influence, all right? He's known as the accuser of the brethren, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Now, why is that important? If you ever get to think that your ministry as a Christian is to point out the faults of other Christians, you're doing the devil's job for him. And you are being influenced. I've seen Christians that are so self-righteous, and they don't realize they're so full of the devil. Because all they do is walk around and talk about other Christians. Now, look, if you're saved... You don't need to do the devil's job for him. He's got plenty of help, right? All right? The Lord looks and sees that there are a few laborers in his harvest. That's where you ought to be involved. He's known as the accuser of the brethren. You know what he does? He stands before God and says, you see what Joel did, God? Did you see what he said? Do you, do, do you see what he just did? Well, there's no way that he could be one of your children, right? It's easy to pick on Joel because he's on the front row. But the reality is he does that. And the Lord, if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ saying, nope, all I see is my righteousness. Man, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> All I see is my righteousness. I don't know what you're talking about. Man, that, that gets me excited because I don't deserve that. God does that for us. But he accu- that his job is to accuse us. He's called the devil. He's called Satan. He's called Lucifer. Most important thing you can get out of this, though, is 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? All right? And, and yes, he is an enemy and a, an opponent and a foe that we need to, to understand so we can learn to fight him the right way. The Bible says in Corinthians, we are not ignorant of his devices. A lot of Christians are ignorant concerning the devil's influence in their own lives. All right, now to reel this thing in and to balance it out, I want to say a few things and we'll be done. Number one, you need to walk around worried about the devil all the time. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. That is not, your eyes should be set on Jesus Christ. That, that's how you deal, the greatest weapon as it relates to dealing with the devil, is to not focus on him. Right? That's what his desire is. That's why he fell. He wanted everyone looking at him. And God says, no, eyes on me. All right? So you don't focus on that. Let me also say this. Just because you are struggling with some things doesn't mean that it's always Satan. It's Satan's influence in your life. Sometimes you struggle with certain things simply because of your flesh. Now, if you stay there long enough, you can open up the door for Satan. But I think that some Christians go too far with it, and they come over here, over in left field, and they say, man, my car wouldn't start, and, you know, this happened. And I mean, I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to pick on people. People say these kinds of things. The devil is fighting me, and I'm really, you know, I've, I, I've, been, I've been sick, and I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with this. And, and sometimes it is truly a spiritual attack. But sometimes, I'll give you an example. If you stay up till 2 in the morning, and you get up at 5, you know, and you drink soda every day, and you don't drink any water, and, and you're eating nothing but junk food all the time, you're going to get sick. Can I help you out there? All right? So that has nothing to do with the devil. That's you taking care of yourself. All right? Now, that said, when you are doing everything right, and, and you're still just, man, just getting pummeled and pummeled, sometimes it is. I'm just trying to bring some balance to it. All right? And make you not get so focused on the devil, but to understand he's a real enemy. He wants to get into our lives. All right? And uh, go over to Job chapter number 1, and we'll close here. And uh, again, the Bible says in Corinthians, not to be ignorant concerning his devices. That's why we're looking at all this. Job chapter number 1. Job chapter 1. Look, if you would, at verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, as the angelic beings, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, well, you know, the reason he fears you is because what he says in verse 10, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? You know what that tells me? Satan was looking for a way to get into that guy's life. And he saw that God had put hedges and he put some things, some protection around him. And the rest of the story of Job is God removing that that hand of protection, that hedge, if you will, so that at the end, Job learned some things. And at the end, uh, the Lord can tell Satan, look, he's still my servant. And through all of this, I have blessed him and he has not, cur- he's not turned his back on me. He's right. Now, he goes through a hard time there. All right? But the Lord gets to basically spoil principalities and powers through the life of Job. All right? He also gets to teach Job a lot of lessons, but I want to reel you back into this. Satan wanted to get in. He was looking for a way in. 
you don't need to make his job any easier. All right? Through your thoughts, through music, through things you look at, through conversation, through the desires of your heart. That's why it's so important as a Christian. The Bible says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Confess, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why it's important on a daily basis to be in a state of prayer. And you know why it's important every once in a while to come to an altar to get cleansed? You go, I don't need the altar. Okay, you better have an altar somewhere. Because you don't want to leave a door open for him. All right? And again... God has given us the tools and the resources. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come in Ephesians 6. We'll have a few other things to discuss in regards to misconceptions about the devil. Um, but uh, we'll get into spiritual warfare as far as the battle and, and as far as the armor is concerned. We'll get into that in Ephesians 6 here in a little bit as well. So we'll stop here.